Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Get This, episode 50 of the Enterprise Linux Security Show. How you doing, Zhao? All good. We should be celebrating. I mean, 50 episodes. Who would have guessed we'd reach this much? But yep. still, amazing. Um, and today we have a foundational piece for you. Um, we've been talking about uh, the issues with patching and vulnerabilities being exploited like a year after patches are available because people are not doing it on time. So today we're going to be looking at something a bit it's obviously related to that, but it might help explain why some people are taking too long to patch while others are taking much less than that. It might be because you're not using the right approach. So we'll be right. covering different types of patching that you can do. Yeah, I love. I'm, I already love this episode and we're not even done with it yet because I, I feel like this is one of those that, um, you know, we could have done before, but at the same time, better late than never. And I think that this is a really good one, especially as we're, um, closing down the year, we have some awesome things coming for January. I can't say anything yet, but um, we have some. We're going to talk about patching and talk about, like you said, the different types of patch patching processes or the types of patches you can install. And it's going to be a good episode. So I think we should just dive right in. Okay, so let's start with the the basic. What is a patch? And this is a quick recap here that's going to take us a few decades back. The, the actual term patching comes from the punch cards way, way back in the day. Um, when you had this big stack of punch cards that would have the code that you would run on your mainframe. So whenever you made a mistake and you punched the hole in the wrong place, you would have to patch the card. And that's where the term comes from. And that's why we're still using the term today. It's when you're fixing software issues. You're no longer blocking out uh, holes in the wrong place, but you're blocking holes in software, basically. Um, yeah. Yep. And the, the term patch, it's ironic how well it works. You know, yeah, it's not one of those yeah. things that we used back then and it doesn't fit today, we have to change the term. Um, it, it, it fits more now than it did then, because if you think about it, our, our servers are like a hodgepodge of different types of things. Like you could have a load balancer in front and you could have a separate database server or maybe have the database server shared with another instance. Don't do that, but people do. And you have different types of servers and things or services that are linked to other services. So you you are literally patching something that's within the you know hodgepodge of your solution and i don't mean hodgepodge in a negative way i'm not saying your solution is bad it's just that's what it is we we have a little bit of this a little bit of that we install this and that but the more components we have in our solution the more things we have to patch thus the term really does fit I mean, it's why we have full stack developers today. It's because software is no longer just a single application. It's a whole stack of different applications layered on top of each other, working together, hopefully. And a whole on either of those layers can lead to the whole thing crumbling. Um, interesting aside, or at least I find it interesting. Um, we're very good at adopting new technology in IT, but we're really, really slow at changing our processes. Um, you know the QWERTY layout, right? The QWERTY yep. keyboard layout? Mm -hmm. um, so QWERTY was invented, <laughs> again, this goes back to the patching days. Um, at the time, the typewriters, uh, the old clunky clickety-clack things where you used to type directly on a sheet of paper way back in the day, they had an issue on the first typewriters. When you press two keys that were close together, they would get stuck, okay? So QWERTY came about as a solution to that um, in a way that separated keys that would be pressed uh, right after each other in, the, um, in separate places in the physical keyboard. So it would avoid them sticking because you wouldn't be pressing keys together very often. The thing is, a couple of years after QWERTY was introduced, the sticking issue was fixed at a mechanical level. But we're still using QWERTY today, okay? So we're using a keyboard layout today that was used to solve a pr uh, an issue with print uh, with typewriters like 40 or 50 years ago. This is how quick we are to, <laughs> to changing the ways that we do things. Yep. With patching, it, it comes down to the same thing. We're still doing things the old way. And what is the old way? It's the traditional way of patching where 
you have a piece of software, it's found to be vulnerable to something or have a bug or have an issue or something like that. So the traditional approach is to wait for your package manager or your distribution or your operating system or something like that to offer you the new version and then you will deploy it um, completely into your system, basically overwriting the old version. Okay, And that's patching as you do it today. You don't just fix the, the hole, you just replace the whole thing and have a new software version right there that should have that issue fixed. Yep. Um, and this applies at all levels. It affects the operating system, it affects the application, it affects basically anything that software related that needs to be fixed and has to be patched traditionally. So in a sense, patching traditionally is basically just replacing old versions with new versions. And that's it. Yeah. And it's easy to do. It's We know how to do it. We've been doing it for decades now and we're comfortable doing things this way. Um, it has some pros and cons, obviously. The, the pros are these that I just mentioned. It's very easy. We're used to doing it. It's more or less the same on many different pieces of software. Um, the, the downsides to it is that it's very disruptive and it takes a whole lot of time. The very disruptive part here, it's important, especially on the enterprise side, because when you're replacing a piece of software, you're going to have to stop any running instances of the old one so that you can replace its files, basically, because all operating systems work under this concept of locked files. If it's in use, it's locked, you can change it. Um, Linux is a bit better in that, but in that it lets you replace the files, but whatever is running in memory will continue to run in memory as is, even if you update the files. So um, you fire up a service, the service is running, you update the files for those services, the instances in memory will only get the changes when you restart the services. So either way you look at it, the process is disruptive. Okay, right. this is traditional. We've done this years and years now. It was one of the first things I, I noticed. I don't know what possessed me to do this. And everyone listening should not, absolutely not do what I'm about to say. So, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But when I was new, I was trying out Linux for the first time. And I just randomly decided to uh, pull the IDE cable from the hard drive while the system was running. I just want to know what the Linux blue screen of death looks like. Because, you know, I'm brand new, right? And then... Oddly enough, nothing happened. <laughs> Weird. Like the web browser that is desktop Linux, the web browser was still running. This is before live media. And then I, I realized that Linux put something in memory. It's in memory, right? Um, as it was from the disk is how it's going to be in memory. And obviously when I would try to launch a new application that's not currently running, it, it won't load because the hard drive is disconnected. Obviously you should not do it, do that at all. Um, that, that was just me being, you know, crazy when I was learning, but um, that's just to drive the point home. The level of what you're saying is true. I mean, when something's in memory, it's in memory and it's in memory from the disk to memory. So if you have the old version on the disk that goes in memory, then you update it the one on the disk, the one in memory, is still from the old version that was on the hard drive before you updated it. Yeah, and that's where the disruptive part comes because to pick up the changes, you have to restart the service or application or operating system, whatever level you're updating. Um, yep. As we've seen and very recently here in the podcast, people are actually avoiding patching and taking way too long to patch. Uh, if you recall, taking 12 months to patch the, the stuff that was being um, affected by Shikitega, that malware version, it's just way, way too much. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, we can complain that our systems are being hacked, but <laughs> if we're not patching within a year of a patch is available, then we're doing something wrong as well. It's not just the hackers right. that are at fault here. There is some blame on the other end as well. And the, yep. the main reason that we see, this is true at TechScares and other companies, the main reason we see for delaying the patching is the disruptive nature of it. You're patching traditionally, it's disruptive, you cannot interrupt business processes for just for patching and systems will be left unprotected. At the end of the day, that's the whole reasoning behind it. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't scale well with uh, today's threat level. It doesn't scale well with new vulnerabilities coming out every single day. It doesn't scale well with the growing number of vulnerabilities year over year. So, and the funny thing is that it's not like we don't have better alternatives because we obviously do. It's just that we are so used to doing things the old way that 
we do not want to adapt and we will not try new things even if they are provenly better. And right. one, one of the, the new ways of better ways, if you want to call it that, of actually patching is called virtual patching. I'm loosely using the term patching here and you'll understand why in a bit um, when applied to virtual patching because there is no actual code being patching being patched. There is no actual code being fixed. The way that virtual patching works is that it operates at a completely different level. It's basically a glorified application firewall. At the firewall level, you will have a, some form of signature database where you look for specific patterns in the network traffic. And if you spot those patterns, you will match them to an attack, to an attempt to an attempt to exploit a given vulnerability, and you will block that traffic at the network layer. In effect, to an attacker that is trying to run an, an exploit against the system, it will appear as if the system is protected, so it will appear as if the system is patched. Again, there is no actual patching happening here, but the, the main advantage of this type of virtual patching, in air quotes here, again, is that, say you have a hundred servers, a thousand servers behind the uh, firewall, and you update your your signature list. You will immediately cover those systems. Okay, so you don't actually yeah. have to go into each of those and actually do anything there. As long as you keep your firewall updated, then it's all good. The yeah. very big downside to it, and I'm sure you already know where I'm going with this, is that yeah, this will only protect you against network-based attacks. It won't do anything if uh, if an attacker has a foothold in the system and then tries a local exploit or something like that. Um, again, it uses the term virtual patching, and again, patching here, but it's not really patching. Right. Yeah, and I can understand it being kind of confusing to someone who, you know, just usually you could take the, the verbiage and pretty much understand what it is. But I think that's one of those without an explanation, you're probably not going to guess correct. There's probably some that will, but, um, you know, that, there's a reason why we talk about these things and educate people in the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, this isn't... I'm not trying to claim that one is better or different or something. At the end of the day, they might even be complementary, okay? With other patching processes that I'm going to mention further down the line. Uh, but uh, you need to understand the, the actual scope of what you're doing when you go with one solution rather than another. This is just a way of emphasizing the differences rather than claiming that one is better or worse than the next. Um, exactly. Another thing that's interesting at least to me, that have some years in, in IT, is the different ways that you, the different processes that you need to go when you're dealing with um, very specific, very specific hardware devices. Nowadays, we have this catch-all term for this IoT. Um, a few years back, it was just smart devices or something like that. Usually, the the patching process for those, even if they are running some glorified Linux distribution or very modified one is usually very tricky. Initially, you even had to use specific cables and you had to use, I don't know, there was this device a few years back, I can't recall exactly what it did, but the, the software for it, it was stored in an EPROM and you actually had to shine an ultraviolet light at it um, in order to enable it to be rewritten again. Other, without that light, it would never be writable. So it was a specific chip that it used that needed the UV light to, to be updated. There is all this kind of trickery that you had to use when you were dealing with patching devices back in the day. So. Yeah. Wow. That is, that, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. That's interesting. I, I didn't know about that actually. Yeah. Um, apparently some chips have this ability to be writable or not writable, depending on the light that is shown on them. <laughs> I, I can't actually recall the exact story, but there was some, <laughs> some issue in some data center somewhere that had problems with those types of devices because one of the lights that they installed on their alarm system would apparently emit light in the, the specter that would allow them to be writable. So they would break whenever the alarm went off. Those devices would be disabled. <laughs> Go figure. Again, weird stuff happened back in the day. Um, nowadays, when you're dealing with IoT devices, the, the patching process is a bit better. And by a bit better, I mean much better. Um, 
So they're essentially running Linux or some very basic um, operating system there, but there will be some way to deploy patches to them that uh, is basically just uploading the firmware through a web interface or uploading the firmware through some protocol like TFTP or something like that, and it will pick it up on the next reboot and you're done with it. That yeah, said, I think that that said, yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it, like the... Firm, when it comes to firmware patching, the way that it's evolved over time is just, it's just huge. It's humongous. Like when I started, and, and probably the same for you, obviously, um, nobody updated the BIOS firmware, whatever you want to call it. Firmware is what we call it now. Kind of the same thing. A little bit different, but, but for the most part, the same. And we only did that when we had no other option. And the vendors would say, here's a BIOS update. Don't install it on anything. Don't even think about installing it. But if you're having a problem, you might want to give this a try. If everything is working, don't. And um, the the risk of bricking devices was real. And uh, nowadays, you know, I think that's largely figured out and not really a problem. But even as firmware becomes more intelligent, even when you go outside of IoT and now you're talking about server firmware, I mean, there's firmware and things that I, I probably never would have thought would have firmware. I had a a person who had a weird problem. I wish I could remember what, what this was, but um, based on, the, on what was uh, you know said to me, I thought, well, maybe you should update the firmware in your SSD. And the person's like, that's a thing? I'm like, yeah. Every In fact, every time I buy an SSD, I'll go on the manufacturer's website. They usually make available a bootable USB image or something that you can boot from that'll scan your hardware and uh, apply the update if it fits. Back in the day, we had to look at probably like 15 different variations of the BIOS to find the right number. Maybe this is the A1 update and this is the B1 update. Your motherboard, same model. Yours, for whatever reason, was a few months after mine. You need the B1 update. I need the A1 update. And if you install the wrong one, you're hoping that it'll catch it. Say, no, that's the wrong file. Checksum doesn't match. Or worse, it'll accept the firmware. No problem. It's the wrong one, though, and it doesn't boot. But nowadays, um, you know, everyone and everything is getting a firmware update nowadays. And it's just interesting how we've come from, you know, don't install any BIOS, firmware updates, whatever you want to call it, um, unless you're having a problem. And the other reason why we might do this is on enterprise systems, not so much residential uh, sector systems, it, you might get an update, supports eight gigs of RAM. I, I saw this, like a laptop, when eight gigs of RAM was unaffordable and you'd be lucky to have four and, this, and the laptop maxed out at four and then Dell's like, yeah, here's an update. If you want to go to eight, you could just install this update. It'll support eight gigs of RAM now. I'm like, that's pretty nice of you to give us that. Um, so there's reasons for this, but nowadays I think some of the um, stigma around firmware patching still exists where people are, you know, from our time are still nervous to do it because they don't want to brick their device. And uh, yeah, we've come a long way. Yeah. Um, the reasoning why firmware patching is a different type of patching um, is that it's often overlooked. Um, I mean, you're patching systems, you're patching whatever, but the actual stuff that's running on the, the hardware, directly on the hardware, is often ignored. But there are threats targeting those as well. There are fixes for issues targeting those as well. When you were mentioning updating the firmware on SSDs, there are viruses that will deploy that will install themselves on the controller of your hard disk. So even if you reinstall your operating system, even if you wipe everything, it will still be there. Um, yeah, this is not your run of the mill stuff. You'll probably never encounter this in your in your professional life, but still, it's something that exists and is out there. Um, yeah, this sounds like the X Files. It's out there. <laughs> The patch is out there. Ideally, you want all different types of patching to converge into a single solution. It's easier to manage, it's easier to track, you can see all that in the same centralized way, and it's just a more eff efficient way of dealing with updates. But until we reach that point, we have to deal with different types of devices having different requirements for patching. The thing with firmware patching, at the point where we are right now, the devices will have a somewhat easier deployment process in place. The difficulty is in actually getting the vendors to, de to deliver the patches for you to use. Um, you have devices and devices out there, and not just residential devices. You have networking stuff, you have cameras, you have storage um, solutions, all of that, that haven't seen an update in years 
simply because the vendor just moved on to the next version of the product and doesn't really care about the the, the older one. And that's a problem if you're security minded because say your storage solution runs a slimmed down version of Linux to run ZFS or something like that or Debian or whatever. And you stop receiving updates for it. And it has a new vulnerability as operating systems get. If you don't get the fix for it, your storage solution is vulnerable. If your storage solution goes, then all the data that's stored there goes as well. It's very easy for things to pile up on top of each other. Now imagine all the images for your virtual machines are there, and if your storage goes, now all your infrastructure goes at the same time. And you're royally screwed. <laughs> yeah, oh, there, there's a couple of things about firmware patching, and you've kind of touched on this already, that I really kind of despise. Um, <laughs> So you basically have an inverse situation here, such that you could have an enterprise that understands patches, they're on top of it. Their IT team, they're on top of it. And the issue, if there's a security event in, in this hypothetical situation, could be um, vendor didn't make the patch available. Well, an administrator can't install a patch that doesn't exist. And unless they want to reverse engineer it, that's not going to happen. Or there's a developer that can do it, they're probably tied up. It's not their responsibility anyway. It's not their device. They didn't make it. But then, you know, you have these firmware updates that uh, may not happen because, like you said, they've moved on to the next device. Now, for the residential sector, I think it sucks for everybody. Um, but but if it's a, you know, a cheap computer that's very low spec, you know, that doesn't get a firmware update and it's your personal thing. I mean, it sucks to buy a new sub $300 computer to get updates. But when you deal with enterprise it becomes much worse. Imagine buying a $40,000 storage array that now no longer gets updates. And now you have to buy another one. Okay, that's a lot worse than that workstation. But even with that, you could um, do your research and find the best mobile phone to, if your company provides phones to employees, to provide to the employees. And then, you know, you do all your research and it's fine. A year and a half later, it doesn't get updates anymore. And just so happens there's a, a an issue that comes out later and they have to deal with that. And then the other uh, situation that I've noticed is um, another reversal, because we keep talking about parallels to the past. Like I remember when, if you bought a camera or a device, the company had one shot to get it right. Right, the, 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 the devices back then didn't check the internet for updates. You know, it was done, it was, it was final. And to actually put out a patch, they had to press a CD-ROM and ship it. It cost a lot of money. Or worse, redeploy an entire hardware device. Nowadays, we could just put firmware on devices, which is great, but then we've moved into a situation where, um, yeah, there's about 15 bugs and this solution barely works. Let's just ship it because we can get a patch out by the time the consumers have it in their hands and they know to, to do that on day one. So now you have another situation altogether. So firmware updates are great. And I love how far they've come, but I also feel like I wish you know, companies would support their devices for longer than they do often. And now that's a factor when you buy something. It's not just, is this storage array or this server, whatever it is, going to meet our requirements at the organization? How You also have to ask, how long do they keep it updated for? Historically, you know, do they keep it updated? You know, is it five years, 10 years, one, two? Um, that might be a factor in whether or not you want to buy from a company for how long they keep that investment updated. You might want to stay away from the ones that will keep it updated for one or two years. Um, right. Your return on investment will really, really be bad on that. Um, but uh, but that's absolutely a factor. And that's something that you should take in consideration when you're doing your purchase orders. That's a very, very big, important point there that you need to check. Um and get it in writing too. Not just on the website. Get, get it, it in writing. writing. Get it in writing on your contract for sure. <laughs> Don't just take their word for it. Um, <laughs> once beaten, right? Um, <laughs> all of the different types of patching that I've mentioned here are uh, all or nothing, all or nothing um, type of deal. You either get the whole patch and you replace everything that's running, or you get no patch and you continue running the old the old way. Um, there is a different approach to this. And again, full disclaimer, I work at TechScare, we do live patching products here. But live patching is a different type of solution in the sense that you don't actually have to replace all the stuff at once, you just fix the actual holes. In a sense, going back to that punch card analogy that I started this with, 
you're just taking the piece of tape and plugging the specific hole you want to fix. If something breaks because of that, you just take that, take back the, the piece of tape and you're left with the hole, but you didn't break anything else. So that's another of the, the pros on this, but still. Life patching works differently than all the other ways that we approach here before. Um, the way that life patching works is that rather than replacing files on disk, you're actually fixing the issues in memory. So we mentioned that at the start, when you're patching traditionally, you replace the files on disk and then it has to be picked up in memory for it to work. When you life patch something, you're actually replacing the running code, or at least the buggy parts of the running code, with the new versions of the code. This isn't magic, this isn't something that's some brand new, this has been around since 2006 at least. This has been used in the enterprise extensively. Um, the, the reasoning here being that you eliminate, and this is the, the biggest advantage of live patching, you eliminate all the disruption that the traditional patching causes. Since you don't have to restart services to pick up the new version of the code, you don't have to restart the operating system to pick up the new versions of whatever you updated, you immediately get the protection level. Why is this important? Because, for example, in the in that uh, malware that we that we talked about two episodes ago, um, you don't need to wait 12 months to patch a known vulnerability. If you live patch the systems, there's no drawback in patching them the day the patch comes out. <laughs> okay, and this is a very big, this is a very big pro towards live patching. And again, this isn't a commercial to it. I'm not. Uh, proposing for you to go out and do that. Um, but when you're considering the approaches that you take to, to keeping your systems updated, do take a look at all of this and see what best fits your, your environment. Life patching has many pros. The, obviously everything has, has negatives, has downsides. The downside of life patching, however, has the, the advantage for the end user that it completely relies on your life patching vendor side. Because the the biggest issue with life patching is the complexity of the patches, but that only matters when you're creating the life patches. It doesn't matter when you're deploying right. them. When you're deploying the life patches, it's just an update. It happens and you're protected. It's much faster than traditional patching. It can be immediate, and you don't have to interrupt anything for it. The yep. the, the negative side is that there are code changes that need to happen to make sure that the life code that you're going to be deploying on your process on your system actually fits on, this, on the, the place that you want it to fit. That is right on top of the broken code or in a way that can be redirected away from the broken code towards the, the new code. This, this is important because different architectures will have different alignment for variables, different architectures have different pointer sizes. The, the nitty gritty, the, the technical details of this all reside on your live patching provider side, not on you as a user of live patching. And that's really, really important. I feel it's so amazing to me. I feel like it's we're getting closer to how I thought the industry would already be by now. Like 10 years ago, I would have thought that by now, service restarts and system restarts would no longer be necessary. And it, we're kind of there. I mean, live patching, obviously, and also auto healing or auto scaling, um, you know, variation of that. Um, we can absolutely achieve that, but it, if it's auto scaling, auto healing, um, we develop that as the administrator or the infrastructure designer. We create that environment. Live patching, like you like you said, that's done by um, you know the service that you're subscribed to. Um, there's distribution specific services. There's Tux Care, for example, and like you said, it's important to, and this is why we're telling you all this is because we want you to be aware of what exists. So when you are looking at your infrastructure and wanting to understand how the best way to update is, you could basically consider this as a potential component of your plan and knowing what's out there is a great way to do it. And that way you can make that decision for you and your organization, what you think is best for the solution that your organization provides. And live patching, if nothing else, could buy you a week until you get to that maintenance window. Yeah, absolutely. Um and this is something that you don't even have to rely on a vendor. I mean, it, the, the complex part, if you want to take it up, the Linux kernel itself has a module called LivePatch. Uh, 
live patch Hate just patch, one word. Right? Uh, no, no, there, the, there, there is an actual module in the kernel, in the Linux kernel, since two thousand and nine, I believe, called live patch. Just one word. It provides you both the way to load code um, in memory, the way to actually create the live patch from um, a patch code, basically. It basically consists of um, rebuilding the, the kernel source, including the new corrected code, and then it will identify the part that is actually the difference, and then it will create a blob that can be uploaded. You actually have all of this functionality baked into the kernel if you want to try it out yourself. Again, this isn't trivial. This isn't for something that you're going to be doing in an afternoon or something like that. That's why companies are doing this and selling it as a service. But still, right. still um, if you want to, nothing stops you from doing it other than the lack of time and the effort that you're going to put into it. Um, if you're up to, feel free. The, everything is out there. Um, again, <laughs> X-Files. <laughs> but, um, but yeah... And I'm going to go back to, the, to what I said before. We're really quick at adopting new technologies, but not changing the, the way that we do things. We have this great right. new technology here, this great new way of applying patches, and we're still doing things the, the traditional way. And that translates, and that explains why we take so long to patch vulnerabilities. That explains why systems are left unprotected for so long why everything is always vulnerable and companies are being breached and all of that. 99% of the case, it all boils down to an unpatched vulnerability. You can check the news stories about the breaches we've done in the past and all the others in the security-related websites. At some point, they will say, oh, there was this vulnerability that was unpatched and something like that. Yeah, and that the hackers know that. <laughs> they probed your systems to identify those. That's why they used it. So you want to eliminate that as quickly as possible in the most efficient way possible. And if your only drawback is the disruption, then there are alternatives. Virtual patching, for example, if it's something that comes through the network, if it's something that is able to be signature-based identified, then it might be your solution. Um, if you need to update your devices, you'll need to look at firmware patching and all of that, but don't neglect patching the devices. Don't neglect patching your IoT components because all companies now have IoT devices, whether they are print servers, whether they are weather monitors, they are temperature monitors in your data center room, uh, whether they are your, I don't know, your ininterruptible power sources that have uh, smarts in it and need to be updated. All of these kinds of things can be abused. And all it takes is for one of them to be unpatched for to be used as a stepping stone to your infrastructure. So the sooner you can get all of those things patched, the better for you. And in the end of the day, the better for everybody, because then your systems won't be used to attack to launch attacks on different companies. Um, again, that's a thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we just presented you several different ways that patching can occur, several different ways that you can go about doing your patching operations. You don't just have to do things the traditional way. In fact, right. there are better ways to do that. You should look into those better ways of doing things, if for nothing else, to increase the security level overall of the IT field. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely just choose what's right for your organization and your infrastructure because no two companies' infrastructures are the same. I mean, you you might even be the person, you know, you that's listening might even be the person that designed it. Maybe you set it up and you know probably better than anybody which of these solutions are going to work best in your environment. Um, but again, knowing what's out there is important. And, and one last tip I'll leave everyone with, if you do decide to use live patching, and you also use a scanner that scans for vulnerabilities on your systems and reports what you're vulnerable to, check the vendor to make to see if they have a plug-in or some kind of way to hook into the live patch service to be aware of the fact that, you, that you've patched it. Because a lot of these will only look at the version of what's installed on the disk and not take into account what's in memory from live patching. So usually it could just be a matter of um, checking a box in settings or maybe configuring some kind of integration, depending on what solution you decided to use for that. But um, if you deal with compliance, it's important to know that live patching by default will not necessarily be detectable by your scanner, which is probably just looking at version numbers. But there's usually an easy fix for that. Check your vendor. Absolutely. Um, just one last note. <laughs> 
if you ask most IT practitioner, practitioners um, and they see an uptime in a system of, say, a year, they will immediately assume that the system is unprotected. That right. There has been no reboots, there has been no updates, the system is vulnerable. They won't even look twice at it. With live patching, and I speak from experience at Xgear, we have customers running multi-year uptimes on many different systems, completely up to date. They just never had the need to actually reboot the systems. Um, so you can look at this as a more permanent patching solution or just as a way of getting you to your next maintenance window for them to deploy the patches at your own leisure. But either way, it's a best way, it's a better way to patch than traditional patching. It's a more efficient way of doing it. Yeah, totally agreed. Awesome. So yeah, yeah. There, there we go. We have uh, several different, uh, you know, faces of patching that we went over and um, hopefully this has helped you guys out. And, um, you know, this has been a fun episode. Yeah. Again, thank you very much for listening. We hope you guys liked it. And until the next one. Yep. See you around. Bye.